Yes, you have heard it right. The title of today's video is How We Position Our Portfolio for Market Crashes. Now, a lot of people think that positioning their portfolio is all about chasing after the market returns. Uh, but what's just as important, if not even more, is how do we manage our portfolio for the future market volatilities, for the future market corrections and the market crashes. Now, that doesn't mean to say by doing so, you can avoid the drawdowns completely. Right. But by positioning well, what we are trying to do is to mitigate some of the risks so that we are affected less. Right. So as the second half of 2024 kicks off, there are a lot of things on the horizon for investors to actually keep an eye on. Uh, so what do we have? We have the upcoming presidential election. We have all the corporate earnings reports. We have the economic data coming in, um, the possibility of the rate cuts coming in in September. Right? And right now, uh, we also have the fears of a possible recession that might happen. Okay, so let's first take a look at the U.S. Uh, markets first. So for the U.S. portfolio, right earlier in June, sorry earlier in July, we did a quick review of uh the portfolio performance. So as of mid July, the S and P five hundred was up by about seventeen point eight percent year to date. Um on in comparison, our U.S. portfolio in the Interactive Brokers account is up by about 16.6% uh, year to date, slightly underperforming the U.S. stock markets, the U.S. S&P 500. Now, one interesting observation about the S&P 500 this year is that the market leadership has been quite narrow, right? It's mainly dominated by the U.S. Magnificent Seven, right, where we have... Um, Alphabet, you have uh, Amazon, Apple, Meta, Microsoft, NVIDIA, as well as lastly, Tesla, right? Benefiting from the ongoing uh, AI-related momentum, uh, maybe except for Tesla, okay? So in the first half of 2024, what we observe is that the performance of NVIDIA, Meta, Alphabet, Amazon, and Microsoft, uh, in total, they have already accounted for about 62% of the S&P 500 return. So investors who are heavily concentrated in some of these tech stocks or these AI-related companies, you would have seen significant portfolio gains. Now, but the reason why, so the reason why we underperformed is that we were underweight in some of these top AI-related performers. And instead, we choose to actually be more overweight in the other US market sectors that have not yet joined in the rally, right, in our Moneyball investing portfolio. Now, you may be wondering then why do we actually maintain such a position, right? Uh, this is because if you look at the stock charts, technically on the stock charts, we believe that the share prices for many of these top AI-related stocks, they were quite overextended and they have been looking pretty frothy to us. Now, the general sentiments among investors right now, right, which is driven by the excessive optimism, it has pushed up the prices by a lot. So it has made these stocks being overbought in the short term. So when what we find that is when uh, most investors can see a reason for the optimism, then you will not be able to buy at very ideal prices, right? From which substantial uh, appreciation is possible with, with such excessive enthusiasm. So this was also what we covered in our July market analysis update right in our portfolio subscription service, the investing note portfolio, as we shared some of these concerns with our members. Now, sometime back in late June, we also cautioned our members to stay objective. Uh, you don't just simply FOMO into buying all the hyped up AI stocks or the uh, Singapore bank stocks just because the prices are going up. So buying with a reasonable amount of margin of safety is really important when the pullbacks or the corrections eventually happen. This aligns with our Moneyball investing approach, which focuses on the sector rotation and positioning early when market breadth is still relatively narrow. Now, and what we understand is that as investors, even when we stick to a particular strategy that works for us, uh, we understand that there will still be periods of underperformance based on near-term market movements. Right? And that is uh, also why we have been underperforming the S&P 500 during this period in time. Now, at the same time, you might have also noticed uh, many investors, they were frantically buying into the tech stocks, into the AI stocks back in July. Uh, some of them, if you ask them, right, uh, they will cite reasons like, okay, because the share prices are below intrinsic value and so on. So 
at this juncture, you might be wondering, you know, why didn't we adopt the same approach as well? So personally, to share with you, personally, we don't actually subscribe to value investing when we invest in the stock markets. Now, if you ask me, what is value investing? The technical definition of value investing is I want to buy a stock at a price that is lower than its intrinsic value. So that when I do so, I'm actually making a bargain purchase. So you do your DCF, discounted cash flow calculations, and then you get the intrinsic value. Now, um, it is a really great concept in theory, right? It's a great concept. Uh, but personally, when we think about application-wise, there are too many assumptions being involved. So like, you know, what is the growth rate that I should assume in this case? Uh, what is the discount rate that I should be using? And this is also the reason why many people, different people, you oftentimes realize that they can come up with vastly different numbers for their intrinsic value calculation for the same stock. Even if you look at reputable sources like Morningstar, Guru Focus, and so on, uh, you will find that they can't agree among themselves on the intrinsic value for the same stock. Now, of course, there's nothing wrong with doing these calculations, right? We're doing some math and I get a baseline for my fair price. There's nothing wrong, right? Um, but that's probably as far as we can go. So value investing, generally, it would be more helpful if it's a, a more stable company, a more mature company where the projections are easier, okay, compared to those young growing companies or, or maybe tech companies, okay, where the growth uh, might fluctuate one year to, to another, right? So in the short term, in the short and mid term, prices tend to move because of the emotions. They tend to move because of the sentiments, Right, by the market participants. So this means that even if I calculate the intrinsic value is supposed to be at this level, it's supposed to be higher, but it may not play out. Or even if I calculate the intrinsic value is supposed to be lower, okay, but the stock can still consistently trade below, uh, sorry, can still consistently trade above its intrinsic value. So this is why instead of doing that, we prefer to move with the overall sentiments and to move with the stock market price trends based on the stock price movements. So what we do is we use technical analysis. We look at the stock chart price movements to identify the opportunities to buy and to sell. So in short, our investing methodology is that we stay committed to investing in the high quality companies and we aim to do so when the risk to reward is particularly compelling. Now, sometimes you will see that some of our positions, maybe they can yield results quickly. That means after we buy, the prices um, went up above the cost price. Uh, but there are also times where certain stock positions that we accumulate, it might still show paper losses before it turns profitable. Now, but this shouldn't be a cause of concern because over the long term, things should play out as long as you are adding on to the fundamentally sound stocks, right? So over the long term, things should play out. We also share these positions in our investing note portfolio. We share them in our Moneyball Investors Playbook as well. Uh, and additionally, right, we make these investments in real life. That means we pass them in the real stock markets. We have the skin in the game and we practice what we preach. Achieving good returns is something that is important, but Aiming for sustainable returns is actually equally crucial. So we don't want to just chase after the highest returns, right? But it has to be sustainable over the long term. Because it's not just about finding the highest gains, but it's about building a portfolio that can withstand the unexpected setbacks. Oftentimes, we also believe that you know, uh, invest successful investing, uh, it is not just only about selecting the, the strong companies, but on top of that, we also want to manage risk by acquiring the good companies, the quality companies with a lower downside risk and uh, a higher upside potential. So we strive to achieve a better risk adjusted returns. So to give you some example, uh, what we did was in early June, we actually bought a Dowie stock, uh, but later on we recycled the proceeds and we used the proceeds together with some cash on the sidelines to acquire positions in Pepsi, and Hershey stocks, uh, where we saw that there were potentially better risk adjusted returns going forward. So this is also why during the recent market route in, in early August, right, where we had the unwinding of the yen carry trade, uh, we saw the sell off in Asian markets, in, in the US markets. Um, for our US portfolio, we were actually less affected. So on 5th August, 2024, right? That was the day where 
the Asian markets, the US markets, they actually had a sell-off, right? So if you look at the performance of the three US market indices, they experienced a significant decline with the S&P 500 and the Nasdaq falling by about 2.9% in that day. Uh, but in comparison, this our our portfolio dropped by roughly about half of that amount at about one, one over percent. So this demonstrates the usefulness of having a risk managed strategy, right? And we managed to achieve this because based on our money ball investing methodology, right, which involves rotating out of certain sectors into where the the funds may flow to next, we rotated out of the tech stocks we went into more of the consumer defensive companies right uh, several weeks before the sector rotation became a buzzword in the financial media we believe that it's not just about how much you make when the when the going is good but how much you lose when the going gets bad as well so we need days like this right the, the, where uh, it reminds us of how that the mr market he it takes the stairs up but the elevator down if you can try to lower our paper losses, it often puts us in a stronger position going forward. So as I as we have shared earlier this year, uh, market breadth should continue to improve right, to benefit the rest of the 493 companies right, in the S&P 500. So with mean reversion happening, uh, as we speak right now, right, and the flow of money switching hands, there might be a chance that the Magnificent 7 may underperform uh, in the later part, while other sectors such as uh, consumer discretionary, they may rebound in the near term. Although in the long term, they are still poised to do better right, for the tech stocks. Now, moving on, uh, Singapore REITs portfolio. Now, so let's take a look at this Singapore REITs portfolio next. Uh, we shared in our investing note portfolio, which is our portfolio subscription service, that we do not wish to accumulate Singapore banks at this moment because in terms of the technical prices, we find that they present some downside risk despite the good dividends that they offer as well as their strong fundamentals. Now, also for the Singapore REITs market, it has continued to fare badly in 2024 um, H1, right, the first half of the year for 2024. And in fact, it has been unattractive for the longest time. And there are many investors who remain concerned in light of the higher for longer interest rate environment. So as of July 14th, Okay, 14 July 2024, the REITs portfolio is down by about 20.9k Sing dollars, right, in our DBS brokerage. Uh, for simplicity, if we base our calculations based on the initial uh, 230 over K, we are down by about 8.8%. Uh, this is fairly respectable considering that some of the well-known blue chip REITs, they have also declined by a, sim a similar magnitude or even more. Now, but the interesting part is we actually, uh, from February this year to July this year, we actually um, added on our stake in the individual REITs with about 80% of these purchases made uh, sometime in May to early July in the FSM brokerage account, right? And these purchases, they were funded largely with the profits from growth investing over the years um, via the gains from the capital ap appreciation, collection of option premiums, and so on, uh, as well as the reallocation of our funds from the money markets. So as of mid-July 2024, the paper gains from this recent accumulation in this FSM account, it has already offset the losses in the DBS account, right, which is a slide that I showed earlier on um, to achieve a break even year to date performance right so um at the current depressed prices right there is clearly significant potential for upward movement from here for the singapore REITs market on the whole now so you may be wondering how is that possible to actually break even for the singapore REITs portfolio when if you look at the indices for uh, Singapore REITs, uh, they are still down year to date. Um, so let, let's show, let us show you our key buy points throughout the years, right? Uh, we have always emphasized to be 
very selective when we do our purchases and uh, technical analysis is integral in doing well when we're investing in REITs above and beyond fundamental analysis that we also apply, right? So for simplicity uh, and for demonstration purposes, let's just use the Lion Philip S3 ETF as a proxy for the Singapore REITs market, right? And also to show uh, where are some of the key buy and sell periods, right? Although it is the individual REITs that we invest in, that we buy and sell in, right? So we didn't start REITs investing um, until sometime in 2018. Okay, sometime in 2018. And we only make a significant purchase during the COVID, during the COVID um, crash. Right. And we have since then accumulated carefully. After the COVID crash, we have been looking at it. Um, we accumulate carefully, selectively. And in recent times, we have been more aggressive. Right. So using our uh, proprietary technical analysis methods, we identified the major price levels where we positioned our funds accordingly. Now, the question here is, does this mean that after we buy from here, we'll definitely see an upward trend from here? Now, we are inclined to think that the bottom has already been reached, right? Though in the markets, no one can be 100% certain, okay? We believe that reasonable buying opportunities will still remain from time to time, right? As well as for individual reads, okay? The key question is, would you be ready for it when it comes? Do you know which are the ones that you want to invest in, that you want to buy? And what is the ideal price that you want to buy it at? Because the thing about the stock markets is that clear signals don't come. Right. The problem is that investors often do not enjoy the luxury of clarity. There will always be something new that is happening in the markets, in the economy, for our investors to worry about. Just as you think that, okay, we are done with inflation right now, but now people are talking about recession worries. Okay, So even if there is no recession, something new will also come along for investors to worry about. So clarity in the stock market is something that is very expensive to buy. When everything seems to be clear, it usually means it's risky. Why? Because some investors, you see, they want a very clear picture before they get into the markets, before they get invested. Um, but to me, that increases the risk. That decreases the reward. Even if you get the confirmation, there is no guarantee that once you buy, the prices will continue to go up. Sometimes you, when you buy, you might re-enter at a point where the prices start to go down in the short term because there are traders uh, who are doing their profit taking from the gap up and so on. Many reasons that could explain why that is so. So in our view, it doesn't really matter, uh, you know, about clarity. You know, when when is the rate cut going to come, right? If the rate cuts are delayed, what's going to happen, right? If rate cuts are delayed, would there be another pullback, things like that? Because we believe that the downside risk they are relatively contained, um, as we explained in our investing note portfolio as well. So these are some of the screenshots that um of of the ongoing sharings that we share with the members of the investing note portfolio. Now, if you want to learn more about how to invest in the Singapore REITs market, you can also join us in our upcoming workshop on REITs, where you will discover how to pick the REITs to buy, how to identify the ideal prices that you want to buy or sell the stocks at in general right, uh, for any markets. So we will leave the link below in the description box as well. Right, um, and here comes the question. Should we do... Read investing or should we do growth investing? Right. Oftentimes this is a, a, a debate among many investors. Now, but what, what we realize along the way is that when done appropriately, read investing can also lead to growth investing at times, right? Where you get good dividend yields, you also get some uh, high capital appreciation potential when we can identify the opportunities in the markets. Now, so it doesn't necessarily mean that money must always grow very slowly with REIT investing. Uh, a potential upside of 20% uh, beyond the 5 to 6% yield is what we could be potentially looking out for in the REITs, Singapore REITs market when it recovers from here, right? And similarly, when you talk about growth investing, the profits from our growth investing can also lead to more injections into our REIT portfolio. So our belief is that you no, know, neither one is better than the other, okay? Uh, we, we want to leverage on both for our bigger financial goals and our bigger financial dreams uh, in this journey. And sometimes part of your money don't have to be invested at all times as well because cash is king in times like these when there are opportunities to accumulate the stocks during some sell-off. So we also 
would like to balance our cash holdings against the attractiveness of the opportunities and we usually do not go all in at once. Okay. In the meantime, uh, cash that you're not using in the stock markets it can generate returns from the money market funds to keep pace with the inflation. So as investors, we must understand that economies, companies, markets, they operate in patterns, they operate in cycles, right? By recognizing these cycles, we can be less blind, blindsided by some of the unexpected events that happen now and then, right? So technical analysis, it can help us to stay alert for the next uh, up or down cycle. So most investors, what they do is they will avoid the risk, they, they, they avoid the risk of no rate cuts happening so they will stay out of reads completely because they are afraid that what if you know the rate cuts continue to get delayed or there's no rate cuts coming out in the near term right so they want to stay away from the reads market first they want to be more cautious until things are clearer okay um commentators on the markets they provide insights but those aren't really actionable right most people they are afraid to make a stand with their analysis or to take a clear view. So we should not expect that our portfolio will be consistently positive during certain stages of the cycle. We have to be prepared for um, to be underwater sometimes for extended periods, uh, but as long as you understand your strategy, right? Oftentimes, these periods, it can present buying opportunities, even though the PNL may look unfavorable for you, for your portfolio before it improves. And this is why it can be challenging for an average investor to continue buying during corrections, during crashes, even though this is the right course of action, right? Uh, the whole point of investing is uh, we want to be able to reduce risk meaningfully and eventually the upside will take care of itself. So for us, this entails an approach of um, combining fundamental analysis together with technical analysis coming into play together. Now, most investors, what they do is they will try and reduce risk by buying maybe you know different reads, 20 reads, right? And uh, including even those that are not fundamentally sound, they also want to buy just so that they are diversified, they're very diversified. Or they might simply just buy them on regular basis without paying attention to the price. So this is something that we do not want to do. Instead, we want to make sure fundamental analysis and technical analysis come together um, for us to pick our investments and the price that we want to buy at. Um, at the end of the day, as an investor, the most important thing isn't just the knowledge, it's also how we add on that knowledge, right? We must be able to take a position independently without any external prompts. In other words, to be a more self-directed investor. So we, we have to learn how to make probabilistic assessments to determine which are the options, which are the investments that are more worthwhile and uh, if the odds are in our favor. So it's, it's a matter of how much you lose when you're wrong and how much you gain, how much you win when you're right. So with these recent corrections in some of the tech and the AI stocks, we started rotating back into some of them as well, although not very aggressively. Right, but we will continue to look for possible opportunities in the upcoming weeks or in the upcoming months ahead. And lastly, we leave you with a quote from the late Charlie Munger. The investor needs this crazy combination of gumption and patience and then being ready to pounce when the opportunity presents itself. Because in this world, opportunities just don't last very long. Now, it takes significant effort uh, to identify which companies to buy and also the discipline to wait for the right price, the right purchase price, right? And when it finally happens to pull that trigger decisively. So if you have enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more investing insights. Do drop your questions and thoughts in the comment section below. Until next time, happy investing.